to fire up uh, for all of our seminar people out there. So would would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, a quick reminder uh, for schedule and logistics. We do have another virtual seminar next week, same time, same place, wherever your place may be, with uh, Dr. Wendy Court from the Anschutz Medical Campus. She will be talking to us about acute catabolic, yes, catabolic response of bone to exercise. Um, however, today we're uh, delighted to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Stevens from all the way across campus. She is from the Occupational Therapy Department here at CSU. Although during uh, 2019 and uh, early 2020, you may have noticed her setting up shop. Oh, my clock's going off. Setting up shop and conducting research in the hallways of Moby. So she has uh, started to join us over in, uh, in Moby B Wing. And uh, you may see some folks walking up and down the hallway with some wild looking gear on them that she's going to tell us all about. Um, I'd like to remind everyone and ask you that during today's presentation, please uh, keep your cameras off. And during uh, Dr. Stevens' talk, if you can keep yourself on mute, that would be great. As uh, per usual, following Dr. Stevens' presentation, you are more than welcome to, to use the raise your hand function and ask your own question live if you'd like to. You're also uh, more than welcome during the presentation to fill up the chat with questions. And uh, I'll be moderating that. And I'm happy to just ask Dr. Stevens uh, your question uh, for you if you prefer that. So I am uh, really happy and, and, and privileged to get the chance to introduce uh, our speaker today. You know, one of my favorite things of running the seminar is getting to look through our speaker's CVs. And this was brought up uh, today at lunch as well. But like all good occupational therapists, Dr. Stevens started her academic career focused on Greek and Roman studies. So I'm not <laughs> sure what she's going to present to us uh, today about, but I assume it'll be something in that vein. Uh, she received an undergraduate degree in psychology and a Ph.D. in cognitive and brain sciences, uh, the latter from the University of Nevada. I know we have some current and former students that are a pretty serious Wolfpack fan, so I hope that, uh, that they'll enjoy the, the talk. In between those two, uh, sandwiched uh, within those uh, degrees, Jacqueline also received a, a master's in occupational therapy from WashU in St. Louis. Following her Ph.D. and, and sort of combining, I think, her clinical and research interests, uh, Dr. Stevens completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School before coming out and joining the, uh, the OT faculty here at CSU in 2017. Her work focuses on traumatic brain injury, specifically those injuries that are the results of sports-related concussion. She uses a range of neuroimaging techniques to study neural function and how it relates to behavioral deficits following these injuries. And uh, she and I certainly have an awful lot of overlapping interests, so I'm excited to hear her talk today. I was, I was happy to find out during our, our virtual lunch with graduate students today that she also likes to tell people she zaps uh, brain. That's how I always describe it. So it was nice to hear someone else uh, says that as well. Uh, since coming to CSU, Jacqueline's been supported through a variety of funding mechanisms, including a, a recent K01 award that just began last year where she's studying diminished motor performance in young athletes cleared to return to play after sports-related concussion. And she, she also pointed out that she really enjoys personal interaction and feedback. So if uh, she has a particularly good joke that you enjoy, by all means, unmute yourself so she can uh, hear you laughing and, and she knows that you're all out there. So we have uh, over 40 folks uh, here attending, Dr. Stevens, so I promise there are people listening to you. Uh, I'm, at this point, I'm going to let her take it away, and uh, everyone can uh, join me in virtually welcoming uh, Dr. Stevens. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. Um, I think you made me sound more impressive than I actually am. So I've got uh, big shoes to fill right now. <laughs> um, all right. So as Dr. Fling mentioned, um, I'm Jacqueline Stevens. I'm in the Department of Occupational Therapy here at CSU. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about determining readiness for return to play after sports-related concussion. And as a spoiler alert, I'm actually going to tell you that we're not doing a very good job of determining readiness for return to play after sports-related concussion. So um, you will notice that theme throughout the slides that I present to you. Um, so I am, as, as Dr. Fling mentioned, I am uh, in health and exercise science. My lab space is in health and exercise science. The lab that I am part of is the sports concussion and occupational rehabilitation team. This is a few of our lab members um, out on a bicycle brewery tour on a Saturday. So our lab likes to work hard and play hard. Um, and yes, we are, our lab space is located in the health and exercise science building. We're collecting data around Moby and we're so grateful for that space because it has made us a lot more visible to the student athletes at CSU who are our target population. Just to give you an outline of what I'll discuss today, 
Um, I'm going to share with you the foundation for my sports-related concussion research. So we'll talk a little bit about my postdoc experience. And the paper that I shared with the graduate students is uh, from my postdoctoral work. Um, I'll tell you how I developed a theoretical model, which was the basis of my career development award and um, how what methods we're using for testing that model currently. Um, I'll share with you some of our preliminary findings. I truly wish I had more preliminary findings to share with you, but unfortunately, COVID has thrown a wrench into our data collection. But I can share with you some new stuff, new-ish stuff that we have for right now. Um, I'll talk to you about the next steps that we're planning. We have actually resumed data collection, so I'm quite happy about that. Um, and we have another kind of arm of research studies that is about to begin. So I'll share that information with you and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And this is a note somewhat to me, somewhat to you that I added slide numbers. So if you're able to see the bottom of my slides, I can't see them right now, but if you're able to see the bottom of my slides, there are numbers along the bottom of my slides um, so that you can note down what slide that you would like for me to return to when we get to the discussion base or the question and answer section of the talk. We can see them, they look good, John. Okay, fantastic. All right, so as Dr. Fling mentioned as well, I mean, he did half of my talk for me already, I think. <laughs> Um, I did my postdoctoral research fellowship in pediatric traumatic brain injury. Uh, so that was located at Kennedy Krieger Institute, uh, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, which is affiliated with Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Um, so this did serve as a nice intersection between my clinical research or my clinical expertise as an occupational therapist and my research interests. Um, Prior to starting this postdoctoral fellowship, I was a certified brain injury specialist as a clinician. So when I was working in the hospital settings, I was spending a lot of time with folks who had had neurological insults like stroke and traumatic brain injury. Um, I worked with Dr. Stacey Suskauer, who is a physiatrist, which is a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor, and she's also a pediatrician. And her research was intended to study traumatic brain injury across the severity spectrum, so mild, moderate, and severe traumatic brain injury. But what we know is that the majority of traumatic brain injuries that occur everywhere are mild, which is a good thing. Um, but it meant that our population was typically receiving their traumatic brain injuries through recreation and sports. So we had a lot of kiddos coming in that had fallen on the playground and bumped their heads, kids who got hurt during sports. So we shifted our focus to sports-related concussion. And you'll notice that that is my area now. Um, importantly, Dr. Suskauer still studies mild traumatic brain injury, sports-related concussion, but she works still with a pediatric population, and I've shifted into a young adult population. But I'm going to share some of the data that she and I collected together with adolescents. So, as my public service announcement and to reiterate, a sports-related concussion is a traumatic brain injury. I like to say this in every one of my talks. It's not just a bump on the head. It's not just getting your bell rung. It is a traumatic brain injury. However, the emergency department evaluations are not particularly useful. So if you go to the emergency department with a suspected concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, they might order an MRI or a CT. One of the hallmarks of mild traumatic brain injury is that your CT and MRI findings are null. So you have no imaging findings. If you have imaging findings, you tend to have a moderate or severe brain injury. So you move outside of the mild traumatic brain injury or concussion category. Therefore, we have to evaluate athletes with concussion with behavioral tests. And we have to determine if they have a concussion, if they still have a concussion, if they've recovered from their concussion with behavioral measures. And often these measures are conducted in sterile clinical settings. Um, and I can speak a little bit about that, although that won't be the focus of my talk today, um, that perhaps sterile clinical settings are not the best places to evaluate someone who's about to go back to a football field. Um, and we do a lot of evaluation um, with symptom reports. So in the study that I shared with you where we evaluated um, adolescents with concussion from a research perspective, all of these adolescents had completed the IMPACT, which is the Immediate Post-Concussion Assessment and Cognitive Testing. It has a good number of um, tests within it that look at verbal memory, visual memory, 
and reaction time. I'll show you those. I'll show you a little more detail on those in just a moment. But um, if you were an athlete, are an athlete, you probably did an impact test prior to starting your season. And then if you get a concussion, you're supposed to take this again. So from a research perspective, we wanted to use the impact and then also use a different measure called the Physical and Neurological Examination of Subtle Signs, or the PANS. So the PANS supplemented the impact in getting us a few more um, characteristics of individuals with concussion. Um, and this was shortly after injury. So you can see I've got a couple images here. We had some gait and balance. So you've got tandem gait um, depicted there. Um, so we had some gait and balance tasks, and we also had some time motor tasks, as you can see the child in the bottom doing. So in these tasks, what we were looking for was, of course, how well can they do these gait and balance tasks? And for the um, motor task you see the child doing, he's tapping his fingers as quickly as he can. And so what we're looking for there is the number of taps per second. And we're also looking to see if he's got dysrhythmic taps. Now, what's important about the PANS that is not present in a lot of other assessments is that what we're also looking for is while the child is tapping his hand, we're looking to see if there's overflow in the contralateral hand. So that happens quite a bit where you see motor overflow during the gait task, during the fine motor time task, where you get extra motor behavior that's not necessary to complete the task. Now, some of that is normal. If you remember how Michael Jordan used to dunk a basketball, his tongue was always out of his mouth. That's an orofacial motor overflow. He didn't need to stick his tongue out of his mouth to, to shoot the basketball, but he did. So some of it is normal. When we see excess of it, it suggests that the brain isn't uh, inhibiting motor activities that aren't necessary for the activity. So, um, so one of the things that we look for is some of those motor overflow signs. And what's so important about that is that the athlete does not know that we're testing for it. So I'm just going to summarize the main findings from this paper. Um, and essentially what we did was a discriminant analysis, which allows us to determine which individuals had a concussion and those that didn't. So we know this because we know what our groups are, but then we put their performance data into this model and we see how well those data predict which group the people fell into. So when athletes with and without concussion took the impact, we were able to classify whether or not they had a concussion with 70% accuracy in this sample. When they did the PANS, we had better accuracy, 83.8%. The symptom reports were kind of right in the middle. And then what you can see is as we begin combining things like the neurocognitive tests and the symptom reports, it gets even better at classifying. And when we use all three of them, we have about 90% classification, which is obviously much better than 70. And what you really want to see when you don't have other measures like a CT or an MRI that can definitively tell you whether or not someone has a concussion. So you want the measures you have to have these good indices of sensitivity and specificity, which is what these classification values are essentially telling us. Now, I noted here that by adding in the symptom reports, we got better discriminant ability. However, there are problems with symptom reports. Although symptom reports are the most frequently used return to play, that's RTP, return to play measure, collegiate athletes are known to underreport their symptoms. If you ask a whole bunch of football players who've had a concussion, if they have headaches or nausea or dizziness, they're gonna tell you no. So in this adolescent population that we reported on, these kids were already out of their sports season. There was really no motivation for them to lie to us. We could also validate some of their reports with their parent reports. However, collegiate athletes are not as forthcoming with their symptoms. Some of this is intentional, and some of this, I imagine, is because right after their concussion, they might have a headache that feels like a horrible migraine. And then three or four days later, we say, do you still have a headache? If that headache has abated to something that's quite mild, they might indicate that the headache is gone. So it might just be a relativity problem. But either way, symptom reports tend to be a little problematic. And one of the reasons we know that symptom reports are problematic is that we observe 
uh, subtle deficits, including impaired multitasking in recovered collegiate athletes. So these athletes are considered recovered because they're, they have reported that they no longer have any symptoms. So again, those symptom reports are the most commonly used way to, to determine when someone's ready to return to play. Yet, when they've returned to play, when they're asymptomatic, we can find subtle deficits, including impaired multitasking abilities, when they return to play. And what we don't know is if this reflects impaired motor performance, impaired cognitive performance, or both. So generally, when we're looking at multitasking abilities, we'll have someone do a gait or balance task, and then we'll add a cognitive distractor in, such as a serial sevens task, where they subtract backwards by seven from a number, a verbal fluency task, something like saying the months of the year in an inverse order. And it could support that the motor performance is impaired because the cognitive task is distracting it, or that the cognitive performance is impaired because they're unable to effectively divide their attention. And again, everyone has multitasking deficits. We're really not supposed to do two things at a time. This is why you're not supposed to text and drive. However, what we see in these recovered athletes with recent concussion is that their multitasking impairment is much greater than an average person who, whose performance may be dropped a little bit when they have to do two or three things at a time. One of the other uh, pieces of information that tells us that these symptom reports are not useful is that we see that athletes with recent concussion are at significantly increased risk of re-injury at return to play. And unfortunately, this risk of re-injury includes both repeat concussion and musculoskeletal injuries. One of the things that I like to talk to athletic trainers and coaches about is the possibility of extending the time that an athlete is out so that they don't go back and tear an ACL and then they're out the entire season. So um, you'll hear me say this a couple times. It is important to me that athletes participate in sports. I don't want to cancel sports. I don't want to remove all sports that have risk of head injury. I just want to reduce this risk of re-injury when they return to play by having better metrics of when they're actually ready to play and by potentially having better treatment methodologies. Okay, so that leads me to my big picture research question of why. So we know that athletes are not truthful on their symptom reports. We know that they have some residual deficits. We know that they have an increased risk of re-injury. And the question is why. So I'm going to bring you to my theoretical model. And I'm going to walk you through this. So if you look at my, and I have my mouse, I know it's white on white, but um, I'm, I'm showing you my y-axis here where we're looking at motor performance, where the top part of the axis is typical motor performance and the bottom is impaired. And then across the x-axis, I have something new, recruitment of neural attention resources. So what I'm gonna get to is that I think that athletes who've had a concussion are using more attention to support their motor performance, which is why we see subtle deficits and impaired multitasking. Thus, when we have measures that we're using to evaluate these athletes that are quite simple, we might see that their performance is comparable. So the triangle shapes indicate a motor only task or a simple task. And the blue, or I'm sorry, so those are our simple tasks. And then the white indicates control athletes and the blue indicates clear or people with recent um, concussion who've been told you can return to play. So you can see that the white and blue triangle are on the same level, which suggests that for simple or non-multitasking performance, it looks comparable. As I mentioned, everyone has a little bit of trouble multitasking or dual tasking, doing two things at a time. So we see that even in our control group, the performance drops just a little bit. However, in our concussion group, we see that it drops a lot. So this is kind of what I've already told you. But what I think differentiates athletes with recent concussion and those who haven't had a concussion is how much neural attention they're using. So again, while the performance between the white and blue triangles are the same, you can see that the blue triangle is higher up on that recruitment of neural attention resources. Likewise, they're even further along the spectrum when they have to do two things at a time. And perhaps max 
as I have it here is incorrect. And maybe max is more at one of these earlier notches. And we've exceeded the amount of neural attention resources that they have when we ask them to multitask. And perhaps this is the reason that they get re-injured. So I think that this is a neural attention mechanism. So I'm gonna show you some of the data and some of the methods that we use to test this model. First of all, when I was a postdoc, we were using resting state fMRI. Um, and this is actually the scanner that we had at Kennedy Krieger Institute. And what we were doing here is simply evaluating the functional connectivity of the brain in the absence of a task. So a person was just lying at rest, and we were looking at the parts of the brain that were communicating with each other while the person was at rest. We compared individuals who were quote unquote recovered from concussion and non-injured controls by creating motor network maps. So to create these, what we did is we seeded the primary motor cortex and we looked at all of the regions that the primary motor cortex normally talked to at rest. So generally your motor network is active even when you're not doing a motor task. The regions that are involved in motor behavior are co-activating even at rest. And what we found is, so by creating these maps and um, comparing the two groups, we evaluated to see where these motor network maps were maybe connecting to. So here's the motor network map. What other regions of the brain are they connecting to? And what we found within our clinically recovered concussion group indicated by the blue bar here, we see hyperconnectivity of the cortical motor network, the one that we just created, to the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is indicated by this uh, image here. So that yellow area is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPFC. There was a statistically significant difference in the connectivity between the motor network and the right lateralized DLPFC. Arguably, the DLPFC represents one of the main nodes of the frontoparietal attention network, which is right lateralized. This could suggest that even at rest, the motor network is hyperconnected to regions that are involved in neural attention. One of the other ways that we've started testing the model, um, and this has been all happening at CSU, is using electroencephalography. So here's one of my control athletes doing electroencephalography EEG in the Brainwaves Research Lab. And what we're collecting here is raw electrical signals of the brain. And then we convert those to event-related potentials. And event-related potentials are simply when an event happens. So when the athlete hears something or sees something, we evaluate the neural response from that stimulus. So typically our zero time point is when the stimulus occurs. And then you see this ERP, this event related potential that has components in it that we evaluate to see how much neural attention, in our case, the person is using for that task. So now I'm gonna walk you through the tasks that we're using with EEG. Okay, so the first task that we use is called a novelty oddball task. This task is quite simple. It is an auditory attention task, and the participant is asked to listen to tones that are played and either respond or ignore those tones. So hopefully this works for us. I'm going to play the tones now. Okay, so that first tone that you heard was a lower pitch tone that's presented frequently. The participant is not asked to respond to that tone. Here's the next tone. So this is an unusual tone and it's infrequently presented. But the participant is also not supposed to respond to this tone. This last tone, a high pitch tone, is also presented infrequently, but the person is supposed to make a button press every time she hears that tone. Okay. So now it's your turn and I can't see you. So you're just, I'm just gonna have to trust that you're doing this with me. I'm gonna show you a sample trial sequence. What I want you to do is when you hear that high frequency tone is to tap your finger. All right, here we go.
Okay, so there were three times that you were supposed to tap your finger. I hope you did well. This is where it's hard to be sitting in my office and not able to see you, but um, that's basically the task that the athlete does. And then we look at her brain response to those tones. All right, so now I have some squiggly lines to show you. So I'm gonna orient you to my figure again. So on my Y axis, you can see the brain response in microvolts at uh, location PZ, which is roughly here-ish, and then time in milliseconds in reference to event onset. So as I mentioned earlier, our ERPs, our event-related potentials are time locked to this when the stimulus occurs, which is the time point zero. Our blue lines are our non-concussed group and our red lines are the sports related concussion group. And what we can see here is at about the time that the participant hears the tone, so right down here, we see a greater negative deflection in our concussion group. And here at about the point, about 400 milliseconds later, when they're making that button response, we also see a greater, a larger positive deflection. This might suggest that for this very simple tone, this very simple task that you just completed, these individuals with concussion are using more attention, more neural resources to complete the task. The next EEG task that we ask the participants to, to do is called a flanker task. So I'm going to read you the instructions and you're going to do this one too. So you will see five letters appear on the screen. Your task is to look at the middle letter. If the middle letter is an H, you tap once with your, oops, once with your left index finger. If the middle letter is an S, tap once with your right index finger. Okay, so hopefully this plays. <laughs> All right, now this is a point that I asked people if they made any mistakes or if they did perfectly. Um, you'll notice that we had congruent and incongruent trials. So the congruent trials are when we had H's and the middle letter was an H and the incongruent trials are when we had H's on the sides, the flankers, and then an S was in the middle. So that was an incongruent trial. Those tend to elicit more errors. And what we're looking with in the EEG here is how well the person identifies and responds to errors. So these um, components of the event-related potential are called the ERN, the event-related negativity, and the PE. The ERN is thought to represent awareness of errors. And again, we've got concussion in red and controls in blue. And our PE is thought to represent a response to or recognition of that error or sorry, not recognition of the error, but a behavioral change in response to the error. So this is kind of like the ERN is like our, oops, I made an error. And the PE is saying, how do I prevent that error in the future? So we can see heightened amplitudes in both the event related to negativity and the PE in our concussion group. Again, this suggests that for this task, they might be using more neural attention resources to perform at the same level, level as their non-concussed peers. Importantly, behaviorally, they look identical. There are no significant differences in groups from a behavioral perspective. So they are their accuracy is comparable and their reaction times are comparable. But we are seeing some interesting characteristics in their neural output. Okay, so the other way that we test this model is using mobile near, functional near infrared spectroscopy. I am incredibly lucky to have a very cool device that my participants wear on their back. So this is what Dr. Fling was saying. You'll see people wearing funny things and walking around um, HES. This is what they're wearing. This is a mobile functional near infrared spectroscopy. It is a completely wireless uh, system. It transmits the information from the person's brain to my computer, which is connected to the device through its own internet signal. Okay, so you can see the cap on our participant's head, and what I'm telling you here are the regions of interest that I have identified to look at to see what happens when a participant does a task. So I'll explain the task in just a moment, but the montage that you're seeing, we're measuring from the right lateralized dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which I've mentioned before, and the right lateralized posterior parietal cortex, or PPC. 
We're also evaluating the bilateral motor cortices. So that's where I've placed my optodes. One of the things about the mobile system is that I can't get full head coverage. When you have cart-based systems where the person has to stay stationary, you can cover the whole head, but with our current system, we can only cover certain regions. So we define those a priori, and we have good reason for those regions. So I've told you that I think that, that athletes with concussion are using more attention resources to support their motor performance. So I'm looking at the motor the regions of the brain that are associated with motor behavior and what are thought to be two nodes of the right lateralized frontoparietal attention network. So that really look, lets me look at both the interface of motor and um, attention network activity and see how much difference there is between people with and without concussion. Now the way that functional near infrared spectroscopy works is similar to a pulse oximeter. So like fMRI, FNIRS measures the bold response in a sense. So it's looking at blood flow changes to regions of the brain after brain activity. But we're actually measuring oxygen consumption um, or oxygen metabolism of the brain. So what we, what we have here, if you look at this bottom figure, is I have an emitter. This emits near-infrared light, which goes into the brain. This is the banana shape. Talk about the banana shape. And the light is refracted and picked up with a detector. And then I get a light intensity value. That light intensity value is then converted to oxygenated hemoglobin through a beer, modified beer lambert law uh, calculation. So it gives me an index of how much oxygen consumption or how much oxygen metabolism is happening at specific regions of the brain. What I didn't mention specifically about EEG is EEG is giving me neural activity with millisecond resolution. So I know the electrical activity of the brain exactly when it is happening. With FNIRS, it's a compatible measure that allows me to know where in the brain activity is happening. So this is the system that people are wearing when they do the tasks that I'm about to describe. So the FNIRS task is called the dual test screen. This is a screen that I developed as a postdoc and it has two components. It has a hand-eye coordination subtask where I ask an athlete to throw and catch a tennis ball by tossing it with one hand against a wall, catching it with the alternative hand, and then throwing it back. So they throw and catch with both hands, so it doesn't matter if they're right-handed or left-handed because they have to throw and catch with both hands. That is the single motor task. What I then do to them is I ask them to subtract backwards by seven from a given number while they're throwing and catching a tennis ball. So we have a dual task component where I've introduced a cognitive distractor task. In the first iteration of this screen, we only had them do the motor, and then we would have them do the motor task, the throwing and catching with the serial sevens, so or the subtracting backwards by seven from a given number. Now we have the athletes do the motor task, the serial subtraction task, and then the combined task. And we actually have them do it five times each in a block design fashion, just like you would see with fMRI, so that we can average across those blocks to look at their brain activity and their behavioral activity. Okay, the other part of the dual task screen is an obstacle walk or a gate subtask. So what you see here is that participants are walking down a hallway, they're stepping over obstacles, they're very fancy, they're yoga blocks, and we are measuring how quickly they walk the obstacle course. The cognitive distractor task, which again we evaluate as a single cognitive task and also in a dual task design, is a verbal fluency task. So we ask them, we give them a letter, we ask them to say as many words as they can that begin with that letter. Um, in the dual task component, we ask them to walk the obstacle course as quickly as they can while also saying as many words as they can that begin with a particular letter. You'll notice that in my image here, I have an iPod. I don't know how long it's been since you've used an iPod, but the iPod is what we attach to the participants' legs, and this is actually from Dr. Brian Tracy's lab. Uh, we collaborate with him so that we can get precise gait characteristics like heel strike, stride length, and a precise measure of gait speed that isn't me pushing and stopping a stopwatch, which is not terribly reliable. 
So what I'm going to show you now are the behavioral data that we have from athletes with concussion and those without. So these are our preliminary behavioral findings, and these were prior to the introduction of the iPod accelerometers. So what we can see here along the x-axis, or I'm sorry, the y-axis is our dual task cost. And the dual task cost, higher values indicate that they did poorer. They had more of a cost when they had to do two things at a time. Um, and so what we can see here, are there are really no differences on the lower extremity subtasks between our blue concussion group and our white control group. However, for the upper extremity subtask, we're seeing a trend where the individuals with recent concussion had slightly poorer performance than those with, um, who had not had a concussion. The accelerometers are giving us a lot more information about gait characteristics, and I think we'll actually be able to see a dual task cost in a behavioral sense um, with the accelerometers. I think we had too much measurement error in our um, initial just stopwatch calculation of gait speed. Now I'm showing you very preliminary FNIRS findings. And again, this was the kind of work that was unfortunately disrupted by COVID. Um, we, it took us until 2019 to get our FNIRS device because of some issues with the company. And we started collecting data and then we were shut down in March. But what I'm showing you here is a contrast on um, in brain activity, where we compare the obstacle walk, so that where they're walking as quickly as they can and stepping over the yoga blocks, versus their brain activity at rest. So generally, when you're doing uh, hemodynamic evaluations like fMRI or FNIRS, you're contrasting one thing to another. So we do get a baseline measure of how much oxygen metabolism is happening, and then we compare that to when they're actually doing something. What's Excellent about these very preliminary data, and I'm only showing you two subjects, is here on the left, I have a non-injured athlete. This athlete is age, sex, and sport matched to this cleared athlete with mild traumatic brain injury or sports-related concussion. So what you can see here is that the non-injured athlete has a lot of cooler colors across his brain. And this is the amount of brain activation we're seeing when he's doing the obstacle walk. In contrast, our athlete with mild traumatic brain injury is demonstrating some warmer colors, especially towards the front, of, front part of his brain, the prefrontal cortex. This might suggest that this athlete who has ha had a recent concussion is using more neural activity to execute this obstacle walk, which is not terribly difficult, than his non-injured peer. So again, we're going to need a lot more data. We're hoping to get 40 individuals in both groups. We're doing a great job of getting our control groups <laughs> right now. Um, and when sports resume, we will um, be able to likely get more folks with uh, concussion through the lab. And we can see if this uh, type of pattern persists in activation with our FNIRs. Okay. If I return to the theoretical model, what I hoped these data have shown you, and again, they're quite preliminary and they're not even publication worthy yet, but what I'm hoping to show you is more along this Y axis, is that we're really seeing that when we ask athletes to do simple tasks, whether it's a button press or identifying if the middle letter is an H or an S or walking an obstacle course, while their motor performance might look very comparable to their non-injured peers, we do see a heightened recruitment of neural attention resources. And the scary thing is all of these athletes had already returned to play. So one of the things that our lab is also doing is following the athletes for six months after they come into our lab and just asking them, have you received a new injury? Have you incurred a new injury when you return to play? And so far about 50% of the athletes have indicated that yes, they have been re-injured. This makes me think that our determination of readiness for return to play is premature. The metrics that we are currently using today are not sensitive enough to identify subtle deficits that are possibly putting athletes at risk of new concussion or muscul musculoskeletal injury when they return to play. 
I think that, again, it's so important for athletes to be engaged in sports. Sports are meaningful occupations. As an occupational therapist, I want people to engage in their meaningful occupations, but it's ideal when they can engage in those occupations in a way that's safe and isn't going to be detrimental to their long-term health. One of the things that we do know is that individuals that have a history of two or more concussions over their lifetime are at risk for permanent cognitive, emotional, and sleep disturbances. So we're really trying to prevent that. We're really trying to prevent this premature return to play after sports-related concussion. So um, moving forward, the next steps for the SCORE Lab is to keep going and collect data. So um, we are collecting data in both the Brainwaves Research Lab or the SCORE Lab. The Brainwaves Research Lab is where we collect our EEG data. The SCORE Lab is where we collect the FNIRS data. If you are an athlete or you know an athlete and you want to come into the lab, we would love to have you. We pay big money, about $20 an hour, um, for people who participate in our studies. Um, and you get to see your brain activity, which if you are nerdy like me, that is a really cool thing. Um, and so generally the athletes that we see tend to have a great experience in our lab and we do need to have more people in. And we do need to unfortunately increase our numbers in concussion. And we don't want people to get concussed. We just want the naturally occurring concussions to be evaluated by our team. So uh, we're just trying to get the word out that that is what our lab is doing. We have future goals of um, using of developing interventions. So if we do in fact see that multitasking is a deficit, we want to understand if sports specific multitasking and virtual reality can improve multitasking deficits in, after concussion. So again, other labs have established quite, quite robustly that there are multitasking deficits after concussion. And so our treatment protocols don't seem to be using multitasking to get people back to sports. So we want them to multitask, but we want them to multitask in a way that they're not going to get re-injured. Virtual reality seems like it could be an optimal place to immerse an athlete and challenge them in a way that is much more challenging than what they do in a clinical setting, like I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, where they're just in a doctor's office and it doesn't feel anything like the demands that they experience on the football field or soccer field, as it were. Um, and so we're hoping that virtual reality can provide a mode or a technology for them to use to try some of those tasks without a risk of re-injury. Uh, currently, I'm targeting the following funding mechanisms, the Betcher Foundation um, Biomedical Research Award, and um, Dr. Francisco Ortega, who is my partner in um, computer science, he and I will be targeting a um, NSF grant for a computer human interface. Oh, and this is a video of my virtual reality. This is a demo video of the virtual reality and it's playing now. I'm just gonna shut up and let it play. <laughs> If you get nauseous, please look away. Sometimes the, the refresh rate is a little slow and it can make people feel a little motion sick. This video doesn't last too long.
All right, these students who uh, developed this were undergraduate computer science students who developed this for um, the Create-a-thon in 2018, I believe it was 2018. Um, and so that is a simplified demo of what we might expect a virtual reality system to look like. Um, there are obviously a lot of areas that will need to be improved upon um, in order to have this more readily used and readily available. Um, the, the dummies that you were able to see, I don't know if you noticed, they were in CU and CSU colors. Um, but I, ideally, we would work with digital artistry, um, so people in design and merchandising who could help us with some of the digital artistry to make the players look more like players um, and really make the task feel a lot more immersive and as comparable as possible to on-field performance. So again, that was not meant to be a, oh, look, we've created this thing and it's ready to roll out, but rather just as an example of what a VR system could look like. And if you've attended any recent-ish events, so prior to March of 2019, we have had our virtual reality system on display for people to try out. Um, and I'm happy to uh, show people the, the VR system that we have um, and, and let you try it. So we have a soccer environment created and we have that football environment created. One of the other areas that um, the lab is going into is another form of intervention um, where we look at the possibility of yoga, improving cognitive motor integration after traumatic brain injury. Um, I've partnered here with Dr. Arlene Schmid, who's in my department, who is a yoga intervention specialist. And we are looking at individuals with TBI. And now this is across the severity spectrum. Um, so mild, moderate, and severe and seeing if yoga can help with their balance, but then we're also pairing it with FNIRS to see if we change um, their brain activity through a yoga intervention that's actually developed and um, delivered in the community. So we're targeting, we've acquired, and we're still targeting a few funding mechanisms, which include a mini grant from the College of Health and Human Sciences, um, an MRI pilot grant, and then once we collect those data, which we're hoping to collect in April of 2021, uh, we will submit a application for an early career RO3 grant. So to summarize, um, my big picture goals as a scientist are to, first of all, enhance the scientific understanding of brain injury. So this is really where I'm wearing my neuroscience hat, and I really want to understand how the brain works, what happens to people that have had um, brain injuries from a basic science perspective. And then when I put on my OT hat, I really want to, and I've mentioned this a couple times now, is help people return to meaningful occupations, including sports, but also the classroom and all the socializing that we knew, know that student athletes engage in. So we really are hoping to improve our ability to determine when people are ready to return to play, develop some interventions that might help them return to play more quickly or more safely so that they can have a really great experience as student athletes here at CSU and not have any long-term health deficits from their participation in sports. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. You can't hear it, but everyone is cheering right now. <laughs> great. So I am going to turn my camera on as well so that I am uh, live with you so you're not just uh, all by yourself. And we are uh, certainly open for questions. So if anyone uh, has something they would like to uh, raise a hand and ask, they're more than welcome to. Or if you want to put it into the chat box, I am also happy to, uh, to send it along. And... I think I'll get us started with uh, Dr. Bell has a question. He says, thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, super interesting. Dumb question. Slides 23 and 26. Is all brain activity aerobic? And is the timing resolution of FNIRS dependent upon heart rate, i.e. Is, is it beat by beat? Um, so I don't know exactly how to answer the first question about it being aerobic. Um, but I can tell you that what we're looking at with the hemodynamic response is a um, blood flow change or a signal in blood flow change um, that's about a six second delay. Um, so you're really looking at um, a baseline resting um, perfusion 
measure. And then we're looking at change in perfusion. With um, fMRI, it's definitely more of that kind of signal change or that perfusion change. Whereas with FNIRS, we're, we're looking specifically at oxygen consumption. Um, one of the things that the rest period of our protocol allows us to do is evaluate baseline um, blood flow and baseline perfusion or oxygen metabolism so that we don't um, inadvertently think that we have an effect of our task that's that's just actually an individual difference. So that's why the contrasts are so important for um, any sort of hemodynamic response research. I think, Dr. Fling, I think you're muted. Thank you for pointing that out. You're, uh, as always, correct. Uh, and, and thank you for your answer. Unfortunately, we're getting a bunch of questions in on chat because I have so many questions to ask you. Um, so we have a question from uh, uh, Clay Swanson, who, who you know well, one of our doctoral students in AGS. And he says that you show greater activity in the DLPFC for the obstacle course task in the concussed individuals. But could you expand on why or, or why you wouldn't see more activity in the motor cortex during the obstacle course task? So I, why are the colors cool as opposed to warm? And I think maybe this is in, in relation to your, your prior work where you're showing with that functional connectivity approach where you see the, the increased connectivity between the motor cortices where you, where you put your seeds between the motor cortex and the DLPFC. And then in this instance, we're seeing maybe sort of specific DLPFC increased activation. Yeah, so that's a really good question. We would expect to see a heightened um, motor cortex or motor network activation during the obstacle walk that totally makes sense and it's just not there so maybe it's just not a large enough effect for us to um, to grab it um, which would maybe even mean that the PFC activation is even more interesting that we're seeing more attention region activation and we're not seeing that motor and we are looking at a quite procedural memory motor response. This is walking. So we may not see as much motor cortex activation as you might expect because it is a simpler task. But again, I don't know that. And I don't know that it could, it, it, again, because these are such preliminary data, it could be just a sensitivity issue where we don't have, we're not um, characterizing that motor network activity correctly. Um, or it, it truly might just be that in comparison to the PFC, we're seeing less motor activation and more attention network activation. But that's a great question. So I wonder, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question sort of off of the side of that as well, because I was thinking about this during your presentation as well. So what, what is your interpretation of this increased, you know, attentional resource uh, necessity for these folks following sports related concussions? So you're seeing this increased connectivity uh, along these frontoparietal networks. You're seeing increased activation within the DLPFC during these tasks. So, so what does that mean from a, a more sort of g generic standpoint? If they need more cognitive resources or more prefrontal activity, how does that affect or relate to performance? So I think of this as like a reduction in automaticity kind of thing where you know, when you're learning how to do a new task for the very first time, we see a lot of concentration, a lot of executive functioning, a lot of thinking through the motor task um, and learning how to execute that motor task. So if you think about the first time you learned to ski or ride a bike, you were thinking so much about what you needed to do. So you were using a lot down of a, a lot of um, top down attention network or attention um, resources to learn how to execute that task. What I think concussion could potentially be doing is reducing some of that automaticity or that learned behavior, forcing people to become more cognizant, more aware, and use more executive functioning skills to execute motor tasks than they've needed prior to their to their head injury. So you would think that walking, talking, throwing, and catching a tennis ball are arguably pretty simple tasks, especially for high-performing athletes. But if all of a sudden their brain is just not... Um, responding the way that it used to, they might be really, really focused on that motor task, um, which would overlap with some of the multitasking deficits that we've seen where it's like they do fine when you ask them to do one task. But as soon as you throw in an, a secondary task and they can't focus on the motor task so much, their motor performance falls to, 
to pieces. So I think that would be a way to integrate and, and understand those behavioral findings and then some of our preliminary neuroimaging findings. So, you know, this is, this is often along those same lines, how we often describe typical aging or those neurodegenerative disease, et cetera, that they lose this automaticity within the nervous system. So do, have you ever thought about the idea of comparing some of your sports-related concussion folks to not just, you know, typical age match controls, but, but to folks with Parkinson's or folks who are 70 years old as opposed to, to 20 years old? Because that's, that's, that's kind of the argument for how they control their movement as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. It's not in the scope of the K award right now, but I think that's an excellent idea. And I think one of the things that this research has the potential to advance into is looking at people that have neurodegenerative diseases and looking to see if they have a history of concussion, because it could just be that these concussions, especially repeat concussions, lead to some of these neurodegenerative disorders, or that even at an at an initial concussion, they're mirroring some of the things that we see in these neurodegenerative disorders. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So we have uh, another question here from Alexis who asks, how soon after their injuries were the athletes tested? Did their performance improve as more time had passed since their injury? So that's a great question as well. Um, we are doing a single visit right now. And we are evaluating the athletes at the point that they have been told by their neuropsychologist that they are cleared to return to play. So that time point varies quite a bit for athletes. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be varying so much based on symptom reports. But I've had some athletes with concussion come in and it's like, well, I'm the goalie. I'm the captain. I'm whatever. So I had to go back really fast. So I got cleared quickly. Um, so sometimes we're looking at a week, sometimes we're looking at four to six weeks. Um, so there's a lot of variability, but the, the, um, the thing that's similar among all of these participants is we get them in as soon as they've been cleared to return to play. So that variability of how long it takes is certainly present, but we're always measuring them at that particular marker, which is uh, somewhat unique to our research lab. So I uh, apologize that we have a, another question from Dr. Bell. We don't get to hear his, his lovely UK accent, but you get to hear my high mountain Colorado accent instead. <laughs> so the question will be less exciting, uh, but I'm going to read it as if I'm him. So a question I've often pondered, 60-ish years ago, if you had a heart attack, the immediate treatment was bed rest to allow the heart to relax and recover. Today, early exercise and cardiac rehab is the standard approach. Currently with TBI, brain rest, uh, for example, uh, abstention from screens, uh, decreased reading, et cetera, is recommended. So do you envision brain rehab and increased cognitive activity ever becoming part of the first line of treatment? Yeah, this is a great question. And actually, so what he's referring to is, unfortunately, what some physicians are still prescribing is rest. Um, but the those of us who are doing the research are, are finding over and over and over again that rest is not good for recovery after brain injury. Um, certainly stimuli that exacerbate symptoms, we want people to scale back on, but telling people that they can't do anything uh, often has an, an inverse effect. Those people become more symptomatic, they have longer recoveries. People who do not, who in the past who have not followed the rest recommendations um, have recovered more quickly. So that was one of the first studies is they were like, oh, these people were non-compliant and they recovered faster than the, the folks who were compliant. Um, and I was just at a talk last October, which feels like it was like six years ago, but last October where they had these female athletes who were either told to rest from physical activity or do yoga and stretching. And you could see a huge spike when they were prescribed either, if they were prescribed rest, they, you would see a huge spike in their symptoms. If they were prescribed yoga and stretching, they were actually um, less symptomatic over the course of time. So we are finding that um, exercise protocols are helpful. Um, I think one of the things that's missing right now is the cognitive piece. So I'm arguing that there is an, an attention component to concussion and that we have to carefully reintegrate 
um, divided attention tasks, sustained attention tasks into the rehab protocol just alongside with the exercise. So we've now established exercise is great, exercise is good, and I think we need a little bit of cognitive exercise in addition to the physical exercise. I would uh, strongly echo that sentiment. So we, we have a few more questions in the chat. However, they are from uh, graduate students, and it's a, a little bit past four, and the graduate students get their own uh, special time with you uh, uh, offline. Well, not offline, but uh, off of this uh, meeting at the very least. So I think maybe we'll just uh, thank you again for your time, Dr. Stevens, and I'll ask those that are in 793 and uh, and yourself to join us in our in our post-seminar recitation. And uh, if anyone has additional questions that are, are burning a hole in you, you can uh, contact Dr. Stevens here at the email that she has on the screen. And uh, and thank you very much to everyone for your, for your time and your attention this afternoon. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, for, for giving us such a, an interesting seminar. I have a lot of questions for you in the recitation. Great. Thank you. This was fantastic. I appreciate being invited. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. And uh, we'll, we'll see everyone next week.